Well, as we continue on in in 1 Timothy 4, we're in verse 6. And what Paul says next is really addressed to me more than to you, where he says, if you point these things out to the brothers. In other words, Paul's gone through a whole list of things preceding this, not just what we've been talking about this week. But he's telling Timothy, if you point these things out, or as the King James put it, if you bring them into remembrance. In other words, these are things you have been taught and people need to be reminded. Uh, The new King James really uses that word. It says, remind them of these things. Then he said, then you will be a good minister of Christ Jesus. Now, One of the things that I've found is that the things that I get in trouble with in my life are not the things that I'm unaware of. I mean, there are all sorts of things that I'm unaware of, and I've seen God over and over protect me from those things. Because God doesn't expect me to know something that I don't know. And uh, it's really kind of blown me away many times because there have been many situations situations where there are people who uh, didn't were really trying to do me harm or really trying to take advantage of me in one way or another. Uh, I can't even begin to count the number of times that people have tried to uh, replace me as a teaching pastor of our church. It hasn't happened recently, but in the past, when I was younger, uh, it, it happened on a fairly regular basis. And uh, I was totally unaware of it. I didn't I didn't even know what was going on. And when those things finally got manifested, I was as shocked as anybody because I thought, why would anybody do that? You know, as I've shared with my staff many times that uh, I can't give my ministry away to someone else. If I'm going to have a successor, I can't give my anointing to somebody else because it's not mine to give. God put it on me. And when God's finished with my ministry or wants me to do something else or just wants to turn my lights out, then he can put that on somebody else. Like Elijah had the anointing of God put on Elisha. You know, it wasn't, again, Elijah makes it very clear, it's not mine to give away. And uh, so I'm not not so worried about something that, what's going on that I don't know that is going on. But I tell you what has been important to me is the things that I know and I forget. You see, uh, I I read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation on a daily basis, uh, year in and year out for the last 50 years, simply because I forget. And one of the things in Deuteronomy that stuck out to me is that in Deuteronomy, Moses said to Israel, you know, it's kind of like his parting shot, his parting message to the nation. And he says some nine times, do not forget, (laughs) do not forget. And then he says nine other times, remember these things. So... It, this is a human problem. We have a real problem of forgetting, and that's why we need to stay in the Word. That's why we need to stay in fellowship. Uh, that's why we need to be in, in Christian community where other people can, you know, take note of what's going on in our life and speak into our lives, and even at times to take the time to sit down and say, I'm concerned about this in your life. And uh, and that gives you an opportunity to have the conversation because maybe it's a um, not a justifiable concern, um, but at the same time, it's important for us to listen because we can overlook things and we can forget things, and that's part of it. But he says basically to Timothy, if you're going to be an effective ministry, it's not about coming up with new novel teachings. And that's my word oftentimes to young pastors is don't try to study the Bible to come up with that new twist on an old theme. Or as Benny Hinn one time said, uh, that you don't come here to get old truth. You come here to hear new truth. Well, uh, the Bible doesn't describe truth as being new and old. Uh, I mean, old truths are still current truths and should continue to be the truth. Truth is not something that changes. In fact, truth has what we call an absolute characteristic to it. It's, as, as it says of, of, of Jesus, that he's the same today, yesterday, and forever. He's not going to become something different. Jesus didn't become God and then come to earth and become fully man and then earn the right to be God again. He was God throughout. He was fully God before he became fully man. And when he was fully man, he was fully God. And even now in heaven, he is fully God and he's a fully redeemed man in the sense of he has uh, the divine body that's been given to him, a divine body which God is going to give us, which is basically going to be a body similar to the one we have. And yet it's basically fixed and unbreakable and sinless. Um, and that's the body I look forward to because I am tired of being cut, probed, and poked. But be that is, he says, 
if you remind them you're a good minister of Jesus Christ who has been brought up in the faith and of good teaching that you have followed. So we don't need uh, new additions to the Bible. We don't need the, the Book of Mormon. We don't need the Jehovah Witnesses New World Translation. God doesn't stutter. He doesn't burp. He doesn't interrupt himself. Uh, God doesn't change his mind. You know, uh, he's given to us his word. He stated very clearly what his word is, and we don't. We need to be danger and careful of anything that seeks to add to it, and or to take away from it. So we have both of those dynamics taking place in the world today. One of the things the way Jude put it in his little letter, in verse three, he says, "Contend for the faith that was once for all entrusted to the saints." I mean. It, it, we've been given the truth, it's been entrusted to us, and we are the caregivers. Paul would tell Timothy in 2 Timothy 2 to entrust the scriptures, the teaching of the Word of God, to faithful men who will keep its form, will keep the form of sound doctrine, that won't change it or alter it or give it a different meaning, because this was a constant fight that battle, Paul found himself battling. Today, there are numerous individuals and organizations who uh, present themselves as pastors, teachers, churches, uh, and they present all sorts of new ideas for which they cannot get sound scriptural support except by pulling the passages out of their context in what we call proof texting. You find a verse here, you find a verse here, and you cobble together and you say, here is my teaching. That's one of the reasons why we try to follow this kind of principle of going verse by verse, chapter by chapter, so that the commentary of the scriptures is its own self. That's the first commentary. We call it the 2020 rule of interpretation. I take 20 verses before a passage and 20 verses after the passage, and that creates the context in which that passage should be understood, and if somebody tries to change the context, uh, then they're doing damage to the Word of God and savaging the text. Well, we have all sorts of things. You have the, like the New Apostolic Reformation, or you have Dominion that says we need to take over the seven capitals of our or mountains or peaks of the world, you know, like the economy and, and uh, uh, music and fashion and economics and, and government and so forth and so on. Uh, the whole word faith health thing where people name it and claim it, or Joel Osteen's positive mental attitude teacher, uh, people who are promoting the idea of meta churches where you just go to church online with your avatar attending in place of you, or even the whole progressive LGBTQ movement that's embracing, uh, that many churches are fighting, we're fighting are embracing, or just being silent. They don't want to address it because it's controversial or it might tre create conflict. You see, when it comes to the issue of false teachings, we today live in a target-rich environment. Uh, thanks especially, but not exclusively, to the Internet. <laughs> the Internet, I feel like I'm using it in a, in a good way, but we also know it can be used in a very bad way. And today, we as people tend to love and chase after everything that's new and improved, especially if it's presented as in short cliches like we got an Instagram or Twitter or in some kind of uh, basically easy to digest form. We don't like the heavy lifting of deep thinking or, or uh, basically if it feels right, if it feels good, if it affirms my highest exaggerated expectations for myself, then I like it because Paul said what we're doing is letting our itching ears be scratched by false teachers. Well, Paul is clearly warning that this explosion of false teaching is a sign of the end times. And what we need to do is make sure that we reject all the hybridized aberrations of Christianity that are out there. Uh, even the seeker sensitive movement that I myself got caught up into many years ago, where suddenly you have to market the gospel in a way that's acceptable to the non-Christian mind. The end of the day, as soon as the non-Christian realizes what you're saying to him, he's going to feel like you tried to trick him. It's almost like I love that scene in Nacho Libre where you know Nacho sneaks up on his friend with a pan of water and shoves his head into it so that he can baptize him. You know, baptize him before he finds out what he's actually done. So the key is that we need to be so familiar what is the genuine as put in Scripture that we'll immediately recognize when there's a counterfeit being pushed our way and we need to stick with a faith that once and for all was entrusted to the saints. We're not looking for something new. We want to know and to hold on to the old religion that was the biblical religion. 
And uh, it's surprising to me that old religion for many people is new. They've never heard it before. So we need to share it with them. Well, one more to go this week, and then we'll finish up this week. Thanks for hanging out with me. God bless you. Go in His grace.